Hello, I'm Jonathan Leonard and this is the last of my sleep videos, one dealing mostly with two problems of slow wave sleep, sleep terrors, also known as night terrors, and sleepwalking. Sleep terrors, which typically affect young children, and sleepwalking, which usually occurs in childhood or adolescence, both arise during the deep sleep stages three and four. So they're most likely to happen fairly early in the evening when these sleep stages are longest and most intense. In sleep terrors, also called night terrors, it looks as though something in the memory processing of deep sleep has set off the amygdala, producing strong fear and sufficient emotional energy to make an afflicted child cry out in terror. At this point, not much can be done to rouse the sleeper by way of gentle shaking, speaking, or even shouting. Deep sleep is not notably receptive to outside sensations anyway, and the siren blasts from the amygdala only make things worse. It's not quite like trying to hear someone talk to you on the kitchen phone while your kitchen smoke alarm is going off, but it's on that order of business. In due course, something happens to end the terrors. Perhaps the amygdala exhausts some key part of its chemical arsenal, or perhaps one sleep stage gives way to another. In any case, the terrors typically abate within 10 or 20 minutes, peaceful sleep returns, and the child awakens in the morning with no obvious signs of harm. So while there could conceivably be exceptions, for the most part, there seems no reason to treat sleep terrors. But sleepwalking is a different story. Sleepwalking also arises in deep sleep, most often in children between 4 and 12 years of age. We know it is fairly common. Up to 15% of all children in this age group experience sleepwalking at one time or another. But we don't know its precise cause. One theory is that sleepwalking arises from emotional or other stimuli that raise the brain's level of consciousness to waking or near-waking levels in some areas, while other parts of the brain are still in deep sleep. As a result, the sleeper can walk, perhaps talk, and has some faculties in place while other faculties are working poorly or turned off. Unlike night terrors, repeated sleepwalking should be treated. The sleepwalker can be hurt all sorts of ways, by falling downstairs or through a window, by running into hazards inside or outdoors, or by misusing knives or other weapons. So take precautions. If possible, have the vulnerable person sleep on the ground floor. Cover windows with thick curtains. Lock up knives or other dangerous objects. And if appropriate, consider installing stair gates, motion detectors with alarms, and locks on selected doors. Beyond prevention, you can reduce or stop the sleepwalking if you can reduce or stop the events that trigger it. And since sleepwalking arises from emotionally or otherwise disturbed sleep, it pays to deal with things that can disturb sleep, including other sleep disorders, sleep deprivation, stress, fever, alcohol, drugs, and various medications. The list is long, but one can cherry-pick to select the most obvious offenders and deal with them. In severe cases, one may also wish to consider hypnosis or even awakening the patient just before that part of sleep most likely to involve sleepwalking. Overall, such measures can greatly reduce or even abolish sleepwalking. As in dealing with other sleep disorders, however, in most cases, it is best to start with the assistance of a therapist or other professional trained in sleep medicine. If we take a broad look at these and other sleep disorders, we begin to see connections. Not only may one of these disorders affect others, but these disorders can have a significant impact upon daytime welfare. That's not just because sleep disorders can affect a person's nighttime rest. For we've come to realize that the brain engages in a nightly memory processing routine that is vital to its owner's welfare. Things that disturb one part of this routine may disturb other parts as well. And these disturbances, whether or not they were initially caused by daytime problems, 
can take on a life of their own that distorts or reduces the effectiveness of the brain's nighttime work. As a result, they can wind up aggravating existing problems such as anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, or depression. And conversely, resolving sleep disorders can help to resolve daytime ailments and improve a person's quality of life. We should note that while we have treatments for daytime problems such as PTSD and depression, many times those treatments are far from perfect. So if one is looking for a new way to get a handle on a difficult daytime problem, it's worth viewing the associated sleep disorders as independent clinical entities and treating them. This approach is certainly no cure-all, but it can improve the patient's sleep. By doing that, it can improve the patient's general situation around the clock, and in some cases, it can reduce the severity of daytime ills. This brings me to the end of these videos on sleep disorders. Throughout, I have been placing a good deal of emphasis on the memory processing of sleep. Those who would like to know more about memory formation and processing in the brain by day may wish to view my next series of videos which deals with that subject. Or else, if you are especially interested in nighttime memory processing, I suggest you take a look at my videos on dreams.